Um, thank you very much, Matt, for uh, that very kind introduction. Thank you, everybody, uh, for coming to listen to, to me speak. Uh, this is my first time in Australia, and uh, it's lovely to be here. Um, I do admit I was a bit nervous when I was going through immigration, and they asked me if I had any criminal convictions. Didn't know you need, still needed those to come here, but um, I'm uh, <laughs> glad, glad you haven't heard that one before. I was wor <laughs> worried that was maybe an old one. Um, but um, I think I'm probably here to provide the kind of, as, as Matt said, sort of reasonable Remainer uh, point of view. And um, at this stage, particularly in the UK, uh, it kind of feels like the referendum never ended. Um, it feels like we're going over the same debates again and again and again. There is particularly on the Remain side, and I think in a very, very self-defeating way, a camp of hardcore, uh, die-hard Ramoners is the term that um, some people use who refuse to accept the result of the referendum and kind of seem intent on, however self-destructive it is, constantly pushing for a kind of second referendum. It's not going to happen, okay? It's, not, it's absolutely not going to happen. We're going to leave the European Union and we need to face the challenges and some of the opportunities that come with that. Uh, what I want to talk about in my remarks here, and I will try to um, stay to time, um, are probably some of the projections, what might Brexit actually mean for the UK, and oh, that's my speaking time over already, but uh, <laughs> glad, glad you enjoyed the joke anyway. Um, but some of the projections, what might Brexit mean for the UK in the long term, and um, what are some things that we can do to take advantage of the, um, the good things about Brexit. So the first point to, to note is that EU membership um, has been very, very good for the UK. Um, Nicholas Kraft, who's a, an extremely uh, well-renowned, well-regarded economist, um, reviewed the evidence, suggests that uh, EU membership has probably raised UK GDP per capita by about 10% higher than it would be otherwise. Um, one of the nice things about EU membership was that it complemented the Thatcher reforms, um, increased openness to trade, stronger competition regulation, uh, pro-competition regulation. Um, these, ki these kinds of rules that the EU, uh, at that point the European community, meant for the UK, meant that the Thatcher privatizations and the Thatcher deregulations were, uh, had more teeth and um, they went very well together. Um, I think it's a very, very valid point though that, pr first of all, we are not where we, we are not where we are, or we're not where we were 20 years ago, we're not where we were 30 years ago. So even though EU membership has been very good for the UK, it's not necessarily the case that leaving the EU will be um, in, in direct proportion as bad. The European Union right now accounts for about 45% of trade. Uh, perhaps it's trending towards a, a much lower figure than that, but right now it's almost half of, of the trade we do. Um, and what's important to note is that the supply chains that the UK is part of, particularly in things like electronics, automobiles, pharmaceuticals, are quite deeply integrated with the rest of Europe. So it's not simply a question of buying things and selling things, it's a question of quite deeply integrated um, production lines. And that's something that um, I think is unavoidable that this will be disrupted, particularly in things like electronics and, for, and automobiles where um, regulation can be very, very important. Um, Having said that, the projections about the UK uh, GDP loss, how much poorer we're likely to be leaving the European single market, are not catastrophic. Um, I think they, they kind of range between about 2% and 9% GDP per capita. I think in probably a more realistic um, estimate is around 3 or 4%, which is not the end of the world. Um, it's very, very important not, for Remainers in particular, not to lose the run of themselves, not to um, buy the kind of end of the world kind of catastrophic talk, because it's very, very unlikely to happen, and it makes us look silly. Um, however, it is worth admitting that a, a more difficult trading relationship with by far our largest uh, trading partner, the largest economic bloc in the world, which is right next to us, is almost certainly going to um, reduce our, our GDP unless we do very, very radical things otherwise. Um, I think the best way of conceptualizing it is in the kind of realistic worst case scenario. Right now, we're not as rich as Germany, we're about as rich as France. In 20 years time, we'll probably be where Italy is. Um, that's not the end of the world, but that's not necessarily where I would like to be. Having said that, it's not the end of the world. Um, migration flows, I think, will probably fall very dramatically. Uh, this, for some people, is a very good thing. I think it's a very bad thing. Um, per selfishly, I live in London, which has kind of become one of the greatest cities in the world, mostly thanks to immigration. Um, I am an immigrant myself. I'm an Irish immigrant to, to the UK, so I have some stake in this. Uh, I have some kind of bias here. But um, Jonathan Cortez uh, estimates that EU migration flows will fall by about 50 to 80 percent. Um, and that's a very, very dramatic uh, loss. EU immigration counts for about half of immigration into the UK, and that falling by 50 to 80% is a very, very dramatic reduction in talent. 
um, any kind of conceivable visa ar arrangement, anything beyond giving a visa to anybody who wants one, um, which, which is, I think, inconceivable, I think we're going to have quite a strict visa relationship, is going to make it much more difficult for UK firms to hire the people that they want. And we all know that government is very, very bad at doing things like allocating scarce resources where they're needed most. There is no reason to think that government's going to be any better at allocating visas to people that it should be, it, it can allocate, it should allocate them to. Um, levers, uh, free trade levers are very, very optimistic about the prospects of trade deals to increase UK GDP. Um, I think that apart from the trade deal that we get with the EU, which is very important because the EU is so large and so close to us, there is almost no trade deal on the planet that will make us noticeably richer. Um, the exception to that is, the, is getting one with the United States, which is possible and is probably more likely now that we're outside the EU than um, otherwise. Um, the projections I've seen for that is that it will raise trade by about 5 to 8% and raise GDP per capita by about half a percentage point. Again, that's not nothing, but it clearly doesn't undo the likely losses from leaving the EU. Um, trade deals with Australia, I mean, I love you guys, but you're on the other side of the world. Um, it's likely to increase trade volume, that's trade, not GDP, by about 0.2 to 0.5%. Uh, increase GDP per capita by an insignificant amount, something that's so small it's not even measurable. Um, the other kind of big gains would be trade deals with China, India, countries like that. But those are so difficult to get, and the UK is relatively insignificant compared to the EU, that I think it's unlikely that we're going to get the sort of trade deal that we would actually like, that we would actually want. Um, so those are the bad, that's the bad news. Um, it probably will make us poorer. It's going to make trade more difficult. It's going to disrupt existing supply chains. And for people like me, who are globalists, it's going to make uh, it much harder for smart, talented young people who pay lots of tax and don't cost very much in state services to come to the UK. So taxes will increase, or the deficit will increase, or if I, I, if in, my, in my dreams, spending will fall. I think that's very, very unlikely, but uh, we'll see. So that's the bad news. The good news is that Brexit may be so disruptive that um, we will be forced to do things that we would usually never consider. Where I think the biggest gains are from Brexit are, or the biggest opportunities from Brexit are, are in things that really have nothing to do with Brexit, but may become um, attractive or may become necessary because of the difficulties of Brexit. Um, the UK has one of the most restrictive and one of the most importantly restrictive planning systems in the world. Uh, this is particularly important in London. Um, the extreme increase in house prices combined with extreme constraints on supply has meant that London is a very, very difficult place to, um, to buy a house in. Uh, rental prices are very, very high, although they haven't risen, very, they haven't risen by that much over the, the last 10 years, but the level is high. And it's possible that in order to attract uh, investment. It's possible that in order in to increase productivity, the government may be forced to deregulate the planning system. This would be um, counterintuitive, given that the Conservative government has a strong electoral stake in not letting house prices fall and in not letting property prices fall. But it's possible that they may be forced to do this because productivity begins to drag so much compared to the rest of the European Union that we kind of have to do this. Um, another area where something like that, where a hand may be forced, is in corporation tax reform, either switching to a cash flow tax, um, such as the one on the, on the agenda that I think is very good in the United States, or in simply cutting corporation tax or increasing capital allowances. Um, anything, anything like that that reduces the cost of investment and, reduce, and increases returns to investment would be very good and would help the UK's very, very poor productivity uh, level. The UK is remarkably low productivity for an advanced economy and um, compared to our European neighbours, we're remarkably low productivity and that may change. We may be forced to do things that will change that. Um, I am not particularly optimistic about these things happening. They may happen and this is where I most uh, this is where I kind of dream that they may happen. Uh, but I think more likely is that we're going to see quite a strong lurch to a kind of quasi-populist um, conservative approach to governance. Uh, we've seen some of this in the fact that most of the cabinet, most of the kind of ruling clique um, in the UK were Remainers. And they are now so desperate to prove that they're leavers, that they're committed to Brexit, that they are kind of doing a weird sort of aping of, of leavers. They're doing kind of quasi-xenophobic um, immigration policy, Amber Rudd's uh, quickly withdrawn suggestion that companies should have to have lists of foreigners working for them, which they then supply to the government, um, was, I think, an example of somebody who doesn't really understand the Leave mindset, trying to play up to the Leave gallery. Uh, Theresa May, I think, has very, very um, statist instincts, and I think that um, in order she will play to the kind of populist gallery to try and um, kind of win those, to win that kind of support. Um, I think that's a very bad thing. 
Um, I, an interesting test might be the commissioning of HS2, which is a high-speed rail link, um, the first kind of major high-speed rail line in the UK. Um, there has been a lot of controversy in the last couple of days about whether a French, whether the French state rail company should be allowed to bid for this. Obviously, under EU rules, it would be allowed to bid for this, but as we leave the EU, we're free to only allow British companies to bid for co public contracts. Um, and it may be the case that this is an example of one of the wonderful opportunities of Brexit, that we can force uh, the government to only give money to British firms. Um, I, I assume most people in this room think that's quite a bad idea, uh, but I, I fear that that might be uh, where we're going. If we get deals with the rest of the world, yes, we may be richer, yes, we may set an example. I don't think it's going to make us that much richer, and I certainly don't think it's going to offset the cost of Brexit. I don't think it's at the end of the world. The best way of thinking it, of it is, right now we're France, in tw 20 years' time, we'll probably be it. Thanks very much. <laughs>